Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I want to thank, thank you for whoever said good afternoon. It was very polite. <laughs> I want to thank uh, the wonderful principal of this school, Sarafa Cruz, for her extraordinary work. 19 years in the school system, 10 years here, six years as principal. Yes. I got my facts right. Okay, Saraf has been 19 years in New York City Public Schools, 10 years here at this school, six years as principal, and she's doing great work. I am honored to be here with Chancellor Carmen Farina. I like saying that. That makes me happy. Who has truly hit the ground running. It helps that she has, I, I, what, are, what are your statistics? How many years in the system? Several. <laughs> so, and is doing a great job already in implementing our vision. Uh, I want to thank Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, who has joined us. We're in your district, and we're honored to be, and thank you for joining us. And uh, our incoming uh, Department of Youth and Community Development Commissioner, Bill Chong, is with us, and we welcome him as well. So the, I want to just thank everyone uh, here at the Bronx School of Young Leaders. I could not help but notice the enthusiastic reception outside and the even more enthusiastic reception inside the uh, extraordinary after-school program here. You can see immediately what's being achieved. And uh, I was lucky enough to get to hear some of the young people uh, talk in their own unscripted, very unscripted words about what they felt about this program. But the good part was I had to first interrupt them from what they were doing, and they were so into what they were doing, it was hard to get them to stop to spend a few minutes talking to me. And I did. Uh, the incredible enthusiasm they feel about being able uh, to be with their friends, to keep learning, to keep doing things that really enrich their lives, new experiences like dance that we saw. Uh, and obviously, you could see immediately what it does for their self-confidence, what it does for their ability to work together, the enthusiasm it gives them in terms of their education. You know, so much of what's powerful about after school. And I'm, I'm here with a true uh, education expert, so I'll give my layman's rendition. But to me, one of the things that's truly powerful is that after school taps into that which children love about their education. It helps them find that one thing or sometimes several things. Maybe it's dance, maybe it's theater, maybe it's sports, but whatever it is that really energizes them and bonds them to their school and their education, and then it has a positive multiplier effect in everything else they're doing uh, during their school day. And so it's a powerful, powerful tool. And you can see here, for kids here in Morris Heights, this is a game changer. Uh, this after-school program really helps them improve their studies and focus and be truly devoted. And you could hear in the kids I met, they were immediately talking about what they wanted up ahead. They were talking about where they wanted to go to high school, what their visions were for themselves. They had a lot of energy, a lot of hope, because they're in a setting that's every single day communicating to them how much potential they have. And to that, the principal and all the teachers involved deserve a lot of credit. Now. I say all that against the backdrop of a neighborhood with more than its share of challenges, as the council member knows. Uh, in this neighborhood, obviously, a very high rate of poverty. 100% of the student body in this school qualifies for free lunch, 100%. Uh, many children come from immigrant households and are learning English as a second language. You know, um, it was important today to be in a middle school setting because uh, I understand that middle school is a particular challenge in the educational system in general. It's not just about what we hope to do in terms of after school uh, to support our kids and deepen their uh, education, deepen their connection to their future. It's also that middle school in and of itself is a particular challenging time in a child's education, and it comes with uh, challenges that we're still working very hard to address. And this is ironically how I met uh, Carmen Farina originally when I was on the school board in District 15 in Brooklyn and we brought Carmen in as our superintendent. I had run for school board on a platform of more focus on middle school. Carmen had already been known as someone who was propo a proponent, a very passionate proponent of more focus and more reform in the area of middle school. And when we got together and started working together, uh, we obviously saw eye to eye. And uh, I knew that she, as chancellor, would bring special focus to all that we have to do to improve middle school and give it the attention it deserves as this crucial link in the educational process. Now, I'll say something as a parent, and I often make this joke. I like to say that I am a recovering middle school parent. 
And that is because <laughs> for anyone, anyone who's had middle school kids, it is a challenging time. It's a very transitional time in a child's life. And a lot is going on for them, socially, emotionally, physically. And so on top of the other challenges of educating our kids up to the high standards of our ever-changing society, middle school is a time when a lot of kids for the first time go out of their immediate uh, neighborhood or the immediate area where their home is. They're now in a bigger setting. They're going through a lot of changes. It's a truly challenging transitional moment, and therefore that much more difficult uh, to address in the educational process. And that's another reason why the after-school program is so important. You could see it with the young people I saw today, because the after-school grounds them. While they're going through everything they're going through in their lives, the after-school is a great outlet one of the kids said that she was all hyper all the time, but when she was in the dance program, it helped her to focus and get her energy out and really you know, participate very productively. And I think that's one of the great things about after school, particularly at the middle school level, is it helps kids uh, to get their energy out in a productive way and get focused on what matters. So we're going to be, uh, from day one, uh, focused on improving middle school all over the city. And we know that when you have the after-school programs, you're talking about a lot of great opportunities for kids. For example, in this school, I mentioned dance, there's sports programs, there's clubs like guitar and stepping and hip hop. There's something that connects to each child's interest and gives them that sense that their own personal interests matter and they can put their own stamp on what they want to do. Uh, by the way, none of this is isolated in the sense that the after-school program isn't just a thing unto itself. It's deeply connected to what happens in the school day. So kids come right out of school, immediately uh, do some tutoring, some homework, remedial help, whatever it is, and then go on to other activities. It's a perfect continuum with the school days. And in this school, over 100 kids are participating in after school. That's more than one in four of every uh, kid in this building. So there's a high level of interest and participation. We could reach a lot more kids here, and we could reach a lot more kids all over the city if we had the funding to do it. So our message today is very simple. Uh, we want every middle school to be great, and to make every school, middle school great, we need after school to be a part of every middle school. We need after school programs to be available literally for every student who wants to take advantage of it, for every family who wants to take advantage of it. We know that will greatly improve kids' academic performance. We know it will help them socially uh, and help them navigate the challenges that come with this time in their lives. You know, New York City kids in particular, they grow up fast and they need positive outlets. And there's plenty of temptation of the wrong kind around. There's plenty of problems around. We're all aware of that fact. You know, we have to be clear as the adults in the equation that if we don't want kids going down the wrong path, we have to give them positive options. And this is exactly the age when a lot of kids are trying to sort out which path to take. It's our responsibility to give them those good options. There's also a crucial, crucial piece in terms of our parents. Parents have to think all day long, and I do it all day long, and Charlene does it all day long, how are kids? What are they doing? Are they okay? Well, for parents who work long hours, a lot of them in the city today have to wonder what's going on with their kids as soon as the school bell rings and school's out. If they don't have an after-school option, got middle school kids, for example, high school kids that don't have that option after the bell rings. It's tremendous anxiety for parents who have to work many more hours before they get home to see their kids. They want their kids to be safe and sound. They want them to have good and healthy options. And one of the things we want to do is support hardworking parents, who, by the way, I think a lot of people in this room can attest to it. We're all working longer hours than ever before. You know, a lot of families that the parents would love to be home, but just to make ends meet, they have to work more hours than ever before. After school programs give them some peace of mind and some clarity that their kids are safe and sound and learning. And study after study shows when kids get that kind of support, particularly kids at risk, it helps get them away from some of the negative things that surround them. It helps uh, reduce juvenile arrests and juvenile crime by very, very substantial numbers. And this is the kind of effort we need, particularly in a community like Morris Heights that has these challenges. This is where we owe it to our children to make sure that every child has access to after school. Now, the picture in our city is not pretty. We've not been 
only not been moving forward. So it would be one thing if we said, well, we've been kind of, you know, treading water on after school and staying still. Well, that's not the case. We've actually been going backwards on after school. We've lost 30,000 after, after school seats in the last uh, seven years in this city. I'm sorry, six years in this city. 30,000 seats in the last six years. And the uh, After School Alliance estimates that nearly one in four students in our city is left entirely unsupervised after school. So those are very, very serious challenges and we know we have to do better. And we know we can do better. And I always talk about the fact that our mission is to fight inequality. Our mission is not to allow the tale of two cities that we're experiencing to get worse and in fact to start to bring us together. One of the most fundamental ways to do that is to improve our schools and to get kids options like middle school. And we've talked about how to do it. If we can simply ask those who have done very well in our society to pay a little more, we can have after school programs literally for every middle school student who needs them. We can have on top of that full day pre-K for every child at pre-K age, which is the most fundamental uh, step we can take to prepare kids for the education ahead. And by the way, if we do it the way I've proposed, five year plan taxing those who make over a half million dollars, five years of stable funding going only to after school and to pre-K, nothing else, and money that we know we can depend on so schools like this can build out their programs and know that they can rely on the funding and keep those programs stable. If our funding is at the mercy of the annual, annual budget fights at City Hall in Albany, uh, people who run our schools aren't gonna be able to plan and they aren't gonna be able to accommodate enough kids. This is why we want a program that's truly stable and long-term and becomes a part of our school system on a constant basis. And listen, a lot of people said to me, well, folks who are wealthy want to contribute a little more. Well, I've talked to a lot of people who are wealthy who understand that we have to do a lot more to prepare our kids for the future. You don't find a lot of people saying everything's fine with our schools right now or all our kids are prepared. People know, including a lot of wealthy people, know that we have to do better. They know a lot of kids are not getting the right start, and they can get the right start with early childhood education. They can get uh, the kind of amplification of their education and grounding of their education that comes with after school. And if they get that, they can have a better shot for their futures, economic success. They can be healthier. They can break the cycle of poverty. I know a lot of people who are healthy in this town who want to see that happen for our children, who realize that we have to do something different if we want to make these kind of changes in our society. So the bottom line is this. We know what works. We know after school works. We know early child education works. If you want to see a great example, you don't have to travel to another state or another country. You can come right here to the Bronx, to Morris Heights, and you can see after school working beautifully. You can clap for that. And that's the message we delivered yesterday in Albany. The model's here. The children need it. The parents need it. All we need is the will to get it done so we can start providing this help to our children. Let me say something quick in Spanish, and then I'm going to call up our chancellor. Queremos un poco más de los que pueden más, porque sabemos que demasiados padres y madres que trabajan no tienen un lugar seguro y educativo para sus hijos mientras ellos van a trabajo. Sabemos que cosas funcionan y tenemos los modelos a seguir. Es hora de que demos a esto la mayor prioridad. With that, I would like to introduce someone who speaks Spanish substantially better than me, <laughs> the Chancellor of the New York City Public Schools, Carmen Farina. Now, hold on, we're going to see if this works here. Look at that. Look at that. Wasn't that great? Great. All right. I think I'm going to recommend uh, that Mayor de Blasio gets the Rosetta Stone program yeah. and starts practicing at home because he's she's, making big efforts. But she's always a teacher. <laughs> um, I want to say that I really truly believe that middle school principals are a unique breed. And they are really the heroes in the system. It's much easier to be an elementary school principal, even a high school principal, than it is to be a middle school principal. And most of them do not get home till after 7 o'clock at night, if then. And many of them also come in on Saturdays because a lot of the programs, am I correct? I want to interrupt so, for one thing. They don't leave until after 7 or get home until after 7. What time do you start in the morning? Oh, I started at 6. 
6 a.m. Yeah. to 6 p.m., right. 7 p.m. That's a healthy work day. Right. Continue. And that is the norm, not the exception, in many of our schools. So I think this notion that you know principals devote their life to this, because this is very important. The other thing I want to say about after-school programs is that it allows students, children in particular, who may not have high academics, to get to know several other adults in a very different way. So a lot of our mentoring of our middle school kids is done by teachers who teach their favorite activities like dance and guitar. And very often, those educators get to see the child in a very different way and often advocate for them in a very different way. So I think the fact that they have more models and more people to work with, I think, are very exceptional. What I was really impressed listening to the kids talk about today, they're building their resumes already. These are sixth and seventh graders already saying, I'm going to get better at this because I, I want to go to LaGuardia, or I'm getting better at this because I want to go to the school. That's the ambition that kids need to have. And in this school, the attendance rate is actually quite good, very over 90. 95. 95. That's an exception to the norm, and that means kids come to school because there's going to be a, I hate to keep using the word fun because I don't ever want to be accused of not being academic enough, but if you don't come to school knowing that there's going to be an element of fun in your day, then why come? So the attendance here, 95, wow, that's, that's really great. So um, into my Spanish, um, es muy importante ver en una escuela chiquillos que se están divirtiendo en muchísimas diferentes maneras. Y en esta escuela lo que yo vi hoy, los chiquillos están sonrientes, están hablando con otra gente mayor, no solamente sus profesoras, y se están conociendo unos a los otros en muchísimas diferentes maneras. Yo también estuve muy impresionante que había tantos niños bailando y en muchas culturas el niño bailando con una niña no es una cosa que dicen, no, oh, no me... Uh, you saw, right? Uh, we saw boys and girls dancing together, and in many, right? Holding hands. I cannot tell you uh, what a trend and a sh shift from a lot of cultures. So what you see here is also social, emotional. Many middle school kids don't start functioning till after 10 o'clock in the morning. This is the time of the day. They're actually at the highest function, as research shows. So having them engage in something and not hanging out on a street corner is the way we need to see the city. So muchísimas gracias y adelante. Nicely said. All right, and let's first do some questions on topic, and then we'll take anything off topic. On topic, Grace. Um, you mentioned that over the last six years, the city's lost 30,000 seats. I'm wondering if we could get sort of an overview of how many after-school seats there are, and, and is there, um, well, how does it work? Is, who decides who gets them? Are there lotteries at school? Do all schools have them but not enough seats? Um, how does the program work right now? I always like to know when I don't have every fact at my disposal, so I will make sure our team gets you that whole breakout. I think the bottom line, though, is that we know a lot of our after-school programs are working well. We also know that there's a lot more demand than has been accommodated. Obviously, for one thing, there's 30,000 fewer seats that used to be filled and no longer are. So when they were funded, they were taken up, and kids had a very productive experience. We've gone backwards on after school. We have to regain the high ground. Um, we know the models we have work. We know that we have space, obviously, by definition. After school, space frees up. We also have uh, lots of opportunity for after school programming in community based organizations and in libraries. So uh, the pathway is clear, but what is obviously the case now is that many, many kids cannot be accommodated. That's why we're so focused on the funding. Jen. Uh, Mayor de Blasio, um, the pre K sort of gets a lot of the press of your tax hike. Is that more expensive? Like, I don't know if you know the breakdown. Like, is it most of the money from the tax hike would go to the pre-K, or is it sort of like 50-50? No, it's, uh, I'm going to get Ursulina since she helped to write the plan. Ursulina, can you hear me? Or is she off doing some other work? Do you have the numbers at your fingertips on the 530, the breakout between uh, the pre-K and the after school? You want to check? All right, you'll check. Just because you wrote it doesn't mean you can remember it. Uh, so. It is more uh, the pre-K than the after school, but we'll get you the breakout. Sally. Um, do you expect after school seats to be on the chopping block again this year when you do the budget? As you mentioned, they've been cut you know, year after year. Right. We want to obviously protect what we have and build upon it. Um, and you know, we think this funding, the, the ideal way to do this is to get this tax plan pay it passed and make sure. 
probably before that happens to contend with? Well, no. I mean, the, the, we expect a decision in Albany to be by April 1st, and our budget gets passed in June. So, you know, our hope is to have some clarity from the Albany situation and then make our other decisions accordingly. Yes. Um, this is for the chance so she could um, respond for us in Spanish. ¿Qué tan importantes son estos programas eh, después de la escuela, en particular para los estudiantes que aprenden inglés como segundo idioma? En muchas de las clases, los chiquillos tienen miedo a hablar en, en, en inglés porque no saben cómo hablar bien o tienen uh, miedo que alguien no les va a hacer burla de ellos. Cuando estás divertido y estás bailando y haciendo el arte y todas esas cosas, no tienes la misma problema en hablar en inglés porque estás haciendo una cosa que te está eh, con mucho entusiasmo y yo creo que eso es muy importante. Para mí, los programas después de la escuela es el mejor sitio para practicar el inglés que no, estás, no, no te están juzgando, te están mirando de otra manera. So yo creo que esto es una manera de enseñar inglés y, y, y divertiros y seguir adelante. So how will you, do you have an idea of how the program will be structured so that it isn't just like babysitting time when the kids are here after school, but that it'll be high quality and valuable for them? Well, I, I appreciate the question because I think there's a stereotype out there from folks who haven't had an opportunity to experience our after school programs uh, or our pre-K programs for that matter, where that kind of uh, characterization is made and nothing could be further from the truth. If you Look at the structure. I've been to a lot of after-school programs in my day. My kids participate in after-school programs. There's always an educational component. Could be homework help or tutoring. Could be remediation. But there's a big emphasis put on making sure kids get right to work on their homework. Now, I talked to some kids in Red Hook, Brooklyn, uh, a couple months back. And they were uh, part of an uh, after-school program that the Red Hook Initiative runs. And it was interesting because a lot of them were new to after school and, you know, the year before, for example, had not had it. So I asked them what was the difference. And one after another, just totally spontaneous, the kids said, well, I didn't do my homework a lot of the time, or I did it late, or I did less of it. And when they got into an after school setting, they very consistently did their homework. When they came upon a question they didn't understand, there was a teacher to help them work it through. So the educational element of after school alone is crucial. But another piece of the equation is that all of the enrichment activities uh, help to develop kids on many, many other levels. It develop their leadership skill, as in this school, develop teamwork, you know, develop their social skills, and that sense of belonging and that sense of being in a secure, positive environment as opposed to being uh, susceptible to negative uh, influences. Equally, one could say about pre-K, obviously you build an academic intellectual foundation at pre-K uh, that the absence of which really holds back a kid's educational trajectory. So there's no babysitting to this. This is all, please, please, this is all very systematic and makes a, a very profound impact on our kids. Please, here we go. The step stool is back out. We've got the new new age step school. Um, one of the things you also need to know that for most after school programs, principals have a lot of latitude in which ones they pick and which ones they leave their building. So it's an assessment of what's happening, and any principal who's going to be sitting here till 7 o'clock at night is going to want to make very sure, I know I did it in my school, that what's in her building and that she's going to be accountable for ultimately is of the highest quality. And one of the concerns as a superintendent, principals will say to me, or used to say to me, you know, Carmen, this may be okay, but it's not good enough for my kids. And I think we have seen over the last few years CBOs up their game a little bit, because in many cases it might have been a babysitting. We don't have that anymore because we have the power to say what you've done isn't good enough. We need it better. Great bad chance. Okay. Just to follow up on that, so for you, what is the metric system then to know whether this is working? Is it just going to be improved test scores? Is it going to be higher graduation rates? Like, when do we know when this is something that's been successful? As a well, I think the first thing, you, kids can learn if they're not in school. So if you have a very good after-school program, um, you're going to get a very high attendance rate. We discovered, and it goes back to the days uh, when Bill and I worked together, I had one particular middle school where the attendance rate was very low. So one of the things we did, we put um, gym first thing in the morning. And our attendance rate sh went sky high. So it's also middle school kids have a very different body rhythm. We know they don't really wake up till 10 in the morning. Their bodies may be there, but their minds aren't really. So I think 
you know, certainly if, if your attendance is higher, they're going to learn more. Because if you have a 70% attendance, they're not sitting there learning. So that's one way we're going to judge. I think the other way we should judge is that the teachers who are working with them that, that are not their academic teachers are doing a much better job of mentoring and modeling for them so that when the kids have issues, it's not going to end up in the neighborhood, but it's going to end up one person talking to another. There are many ways to assess success and in after school programs. In this particular school, the shows we saw today are all gonna have an end of the year performance. When those kids get on the stage to put on their play or do their dance, they're gonna be expected to perform at a very high level and they're gonna be assessed on that, correctly? And the audience will assess them. So there's many ways to assess kids that's not just test driven. I think there's a point about homework too. Yeah. You know, kids that are giving in their homework on time and completed. You can measure that very easily. Teachers do that every single day. Uh, and that's one of the great values of after school. It's gonna greatly increase the amount of homework that gets done on time and gets done well and is completed. So there's lots of different measures, but I wanna make amplify this point about the end of year performance. That I, I know um, uh, people think in terms of the educational system, a lot of prisms, a lot of assumptions, but one thing that we have to do is really think of this from a human perspective. And what we're trying to breed in our children and support in our children is self-confidence. We're trying to give them hope for their future. We're trying to give them belief in themselves, uh, self-respect. And when you get up there in front of an audience and you perform at that high level, as Carmen indicated, and you, you hear the people of your neighborhood applauding you, it makes a big, big impact. And a lot of kids don't get that opportunity for affirmation unless it's they have an opportunity like an after school program to provide it. When you have highly motivated kids who believe that they are on their way somewhere, just like the kids we gathered with after the dance performance, literally every single one was talking about what they saw their future as with real energy. Those are kids who are gonna keep devoting themselves to their schoolwork and do better all the time. Beth. We've seen a lot of press conferences lately devoted to your tax plan, mm -hmm. pre-K and now middle school, after school programs. So can you tell us You've got less than three months before the Albany budget has to be approved. What is going on behind the scenes? Who are you meeting with? The governor was in town today. Did you talk? Did you meet? You want me to tell you all my behind the scenes uh, special meetings? The strategy. No, look, it's, it's very straightforward. And I think yesterday in Albany was a great indicator of that. Uh, the message is getting through. You know, I met with literally every element of the state government yesterday. And, uh, and both sides of the aisle, both houses of the legislature, obviously the governor as well, and the message is getting through. And part of what I think leadership is, is setting a goal, you know, and saying this is something our people need and our children need. So uh, all over Albany yesterday, people were responding to that proposal in a good way, in a positive way. I think now begins the real work. Three months is an eternity in the budget process, as you know. Um, but I think we start with real support uh, in the Assembly and in the Senate, very vocal support, that we have to keep building upon. And um, you've seen the poll numbers, so the people already have spoken. Uh, this is about doing the mechanics now. So it'll be incessant discussions among the elected officials, obviously the staff, uh, and we have great confidence in the Chancellor and her team and our Budget Director, Dean Foulihan, who's a, an Albany veteran. He'll be deeply involved. And, we think at the end of the day, people are going to agree that this is the right way to do things. Yes. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, if you get the full 530, how many, how many people, how many seats will there be? How many kids might be affected by this? So what we need to do, I'm sorry we've been at this so long that some of the stuff we passed out in the beginning of this process has now been my 16th month on this issue. So we, we've been at it a while now. We want it, let's make sure, I'm looking to Phil and Ursulina, that we get the whole rundown out to everyone and so you can see. Literally, I mean, on the pre-K side, we've been very specific because it's a little easier to get to very exact numbers. We know right now there's 40,000 kids that get only half day uh, pre-K. We know there's 10,000 that get nothing even though they're pre-K age. So we've got a universe of about 50,000 that we want to upgrade. To, from half day to full day or from zero to full day. On the after school side, it is gonna be much more about the choices that parents make and kids make. We wanna make sure it is universally available. We know there's high levels of demand going unmet. We know we've lost 30,000 seats over the last uh, five, six years. Um, but again, it's in part, it's a little bit chicken and egg. The better the programs are, the more that people see the success, the more kids are gonna join them, the more parents are gonna push their kids to choose after school instead of going home after school. So that's something that will play out over time, but we'll get you the full breakout so you have it. 
Yes. Sorry if I've got this number wrong. I believe, Chancellor, you said that the number of kids involved enrolled in after school programs at the school is about one in four. I said one in four. Can you talk a little bit about why at this particular school more kids aren't enrolled? Is it a lack of options? Teachers don't want to stay late? What what is what are the I don't want to speak beyond uh, the details. I know if uh, the principal is more than welcome to, I'll just start by saying in every school I've been in, one of the issues is resources. And, you know, it takes resources to cover all of the elements of providing the, the after school programming. So, you know, I think, uh, again, we have a lot of models of after school working. We have a lot of kids who are participating and having a great experience, but we don't have enough resources to get to every kid who needs it. The other thing I should say, that hey, many schools, and this might be one of them, <clears throat> you also have older kids taking care of younger kids, and that's a really big issue. So eventually, when we start looking at after school, it would also be intergenerational. And I don't mean 70-year-olds with 40-year-olds. I mean 12-year-olds with 8-year-olds, because in many neighborhoods, they have to go home and take care of the kids while the parents work. So there's a lot of configurations that we have to look at to make sure the kids can enjoy their teenage years while still making sure families are provided for in the ways they need. Yes. I was to ask a question about charter schools. So just let's finish on this, and then we'll go. To, you'll be you'll be first on off topic. So staying on after school and the tax plan. Go ahead. You said yourself being a parent. Yeah. I was. The co I was the president of this district, this school district's president's council, and it's representative on the chancellor's parent advisory council. Now, as parents, we know that parent involvement is important. Yes. Uh, what do you, under Mayor Bloomberg, parent involvement has plummeted to almost zero. Mm -hmm. Chancellor Farino, what are you going to do to increase parent involvement? Well. Again, I find that a little off topic. So let me let me do this. I'm going to hold you. I'm going to put you in queue. We're definitely a crucial question, but you'll go first. You'll go second when we finish on the this plan. So let's just stay. Anything else on after school and the tax plan? Last call. Yes. So just to understand, in terms of the middle school after school programs, you're not going to restrict it to any certain type of after school program, or there won't be any parameters. Like they're not going to have to do a certain amount of homework. Um, you're going to let the principals and the market kind of decide? Uh, a little bit different. I'll start, and Carmen may want to add. The question is whether, you know, what the standards will be for it. When we announced this, again, this seems like a century ago, back in October 2012, um, the model that we were working on was the after-school corporation model. So it's an existing approach, works here in New York City, very respected, um, that combines a certain amount of tutoring and homework help with a certain amount of arts, culture, recreation. Uh, if I could just say as a layman, almost every after-school program I've seen does some variation on that. I think you know, the broad approach is pretty consistent. But I think uh, Carmen's point is well taken. This is a constant effort to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade again. So it means that as we start down this road, we want to borrow from the best models available, both with after-school and with pre-K, and then continue to perfect them every year. It's a constant effort to make it better. But I think the point Carmen made that each principal uh, according to their own strategic approach, will favor certain pieces within after school and might adjust their own programs or look for a provider that particularly fits their philosophy. Maybe, for example, as we talked about, the dual language element uh, being crucial in a lot of programs. Uh, I think a lot of people in this room know it, but I think that in terms of what we can do to help kids who are English language learners, both with pre-K and after school, it's a huge potential addition to our capacity to reach kids for whom language is still a challenge. So it will be adjusted within each school, but I think the broad model is pretty consistent, that mix of academic and other types of activities that inspire and energize kids. Do you want to add? I, there are, there's one big program now, the extended time, which actually has a formula for what programs should be and the percentage of time should be spent on academic versus something else. And some of these programs actually even have Saturday programs so that they have an extension into the weekend, which is crucial, I think, uh, for kids. So I think we're going to look at the best of those programs. To me, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You have to replicate what works. And that's one of the reasons I'm visiting so many middle schools. This is my second one today. Um, I just want, can I answer his question or do I have to let's, go? Let's just give okay. just for, yes, we're going to get there. Okay. But let's just finish just in the sake of consistency. Okay. Is there yeah, anything else there. on after school and the tax plan? Yes. As far as locations and where it's going to happen, is every school going to be expected, if they don't already, to have after school program or will some kids go to other buildings? Well, so again, this is for all. The, the goal here is that every single middle school child 
who and their family that want to take part in it get an opportunity. Now, Carmen made a very crucial point. There's a lot of kids in this town who have not had the experience of after school. Maybe it's because they have to take a sibling home, or you know, maybe it's because they and that school might be you know a mile away and they have to go get their sibling. There's lots of different reasons why parents that don't understand the after schools available to them aren't comfortable with it. We have work to do first to let people know it will be universally available. When we achieve this, the first message will be this is available to all. The second will be to go out there and show a lot of parents who maybe haven't experienced before what good it can do for their kids and how it can be a game changer for their kids. So in many, many schools, you'll have the option right there in the school to use available school space. Where needed, we have two other go-to options that are fantastic, our libraries, and the heads of our library systems have been very enthusiastic about opening up library space for after school, and our community-based organizations, and a lot of them already sponsor, and Bill Chong is an expert on this, a lot of them already sponsor after school. So whereas with pre-K, I'm the first to say in year one, we're gonna get our hands on all the space we can and then keep building out, including in some cases, creating new space, creating pre-K centers, et cetera. With after school, we already have a very, very substantial space dynamic in our favor. It's really about the funding and it's about letting people know it's universal. Remember, when something is not universal, I think this is a very important strategic point that I probably haven't said frequently enough. When something is universally available, people respond to it differently than when it's not universally available. People know broadly in our society that kindergarten's available, first grade's available, second grade's available. You know, there's a lot of things in society that are well known to be universally available. You can walk into a library. But until now in this town, pre-K has not been, has explicitly not been universally available, particularly on a full day basis. After school has explicitly not been universally available. So we are trying to change the culture, change the assumptions. When every parent in this town knows that when your child gets to pre-K age, they are guaranteed a pre-K seat in your immediate area. When your child gets to sixth, seventh, eighth grade in middle school, they are guaranteed an after school seat, typically, for example, from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And you can, you can count on it, you can build your schedule around it, you can build your life around it, you're gonna know your kids are safe and sound. That will change behavior intensely and for the better. So this is a process of construction, but we're convinced people will really respond to it. Someone was over here, yes, no, okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about staffing on the after school programs and teachers and DOE staff versus outside providers? Well, we're, I'll, I'll start and Carmen can feel free to add. We, we think that both models are good. You know, you have uh, teachers who uh, add to their work day with this and you have people at community-based organizations. You know, you have a lot of different options for how to get it done, library staff. So uh, there's a, a tremendous body of talented people available to be plugged in. Do you have anything to add on no, that? I okay. Think that's exactly right. Okay, still on this before, and then when we switch, your first, your second. Anything else on after school tax plan? No, you're up. So I just want to ask about charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, critics of charter schools often say that they push out struggling students, but there's an IBO report today that says generally they do not push out struggling students. Uh, any more than traditional schools. Does this change your view of charter schools at all? And do you still plan to charge rent? And if so, when? I like your 12-part question. Um, first, I have not seen the report. I look forward to seeing it. I think everyone in this room would agree. Uh, no one report answers all questions, but I'm glad they did the study and I look forward to learning from it. Um, I think we can safely say that there are charter schools in this town that cover as least as many English language learners as their district, uh, at least as many special needs kids as their district. And I think we can safely say there are some that noticeably do not. And that has been our central concern, that we wanna see consistency and representation. So I think it's easy to answer the IBO report and say this, I'm happy to hear there's some progress, I do know for a fact there's some that are not meeting that standard and we have to address that. On the question of rent, I believe fundamentally what I've said. Uh, again, it's a norm around much of the country to charge appropriate rent. I've gone a step further and said a sliding scale approach, which I think is a fair approach. Depending on the resources the charter has, we'll handle it differently. Some will not have to pay anything. But I think it's fair 
and I think it brings in resources we need to do a lot of other important work for our kids. So I'm very comfortable with our approach. We're going to work with the charter schools, but we're going to hold them accountable like traditional public schools. That's really the essence of what I've been trying to say. Uh, charters were favored in the Bloomberg years, period. It's not a mystery. Everyone knows it. Certain charter organizations, like Eva Moskowitz's organization, was particularly favored. We're not doing that anymore. We're going to focus on all of our traditional public schools. I think we have 1,700 or so now. We're going to focus on charter schools, too. And those that are performing well, we're going to work with. Those that are inclusive, we're going to work with. Those that have problems, be they traditional or charter, we're going to push to do better. When the rent will begin. We have to, you know, as with everything, we've got our uh, goals in place. We now have to work out the details of the policy. It's going to take us a certain number of months, and when we have a better sense of that, we can give you an update. But obviously, the chancellor just got here. I just got here, so it's going to take a while for us to get that together. On parent involvement, hold on, you go number two. Parent involvement, you, take, you start, Carmen. I can tell you're raring to go. <clears throat> One of the things that I said when I came on board, that the only department in the uh, DOE that's going to report directly to me is the Parent Engagement Department. So starting today, and actually we've been meeting with uh, parent groups, and actually one here from District 9 uh, on, on a regular basis. But one of the things I did starting today is I met with the, uh, the CPAC group, and some of you might have been there this morning. So one of the things I asked that group to do is to put on a green card. I have, I'm color coding. I'm very big on color coding. And I asked um, that the head of every, um, every district, including the high school districts, to write down the biggest problem that they have in their particular district with their phone number so that I could actually go back and give them a call and see what the issues are and which issues are consistent across the board that we can deal with. Uh, I'm meeting with the CEC presidents, I believe, next week, and they're going to get an orange card so that we are going to listen. Well, are we always going to agree? No. But we're going to listen. We're going to react. One of the, that, the only thing I really learned in going to principal school is that there's one word you need to know, and it's called AIR, A-I-R. You acknowledge the problem, you investigate it, and you respond. And that's really one of the things that we're going to do with parents. So uh, today, you know, there were almost parents there from the entire city. And the CEC presidents, I invited them all to come. And then I'm going to go out to the individual districts and see what we can do. Let me add to that. Um, when I was on the school board, when I was in the city council, and as public advocate, I focused a lot on the question of parent involvement. I think it is a huge X factor in our school system. And I want to thank, in my time as public advocate, I had two great, great allies in this work uh, who were in the public advocate's office. You know Ursula and Ramirez, who did an incredible job, particularly on the issue of parent uh, involvement, parent uh, organizing, and parent involvement in general. Uh, Sadie Campo Amor, who's standing over. I'm talking about you, Sadie. You can't whisper with Phil while I'm talking to you. Sadie Campo Amor did an incredible job uh, in the public advocate's office, encouraging parents to get more deeply involved now has gone over to join uh, Carmen and her team. So uh, we always put a focus on this issue. And um, the reason I do is, as a parent, I, uh, first of all, understand parents are stakeholders in this equation. And they were not, over the last 12 years, treated that way. Uh, I always like to say parents are the first and last teachers of our children. And if you truly engage parents in the process, you're going to get a much better outcome. If parents are right there with the teachers every step of the way, uh, making sure kids do their reading, making sure they do their homework, you know, if parents can stay in constant touch with teachers, one of the things I want to see us do better in this town is make parent-teacher conferences more accessible and more parent-friendly. Uh, I want to help build PTA involvement because that's a great tool, but in many schools, it's not where it needs to be. So there's a lot that we have not done on a systematic basis to truly involve parents. When you do, you have a huge amount of new energy uh, helping kids to get their schoolwork done, creating accountability towards the kids, but also creating accountability back at the principal and the teachers in a very healthy way. And parents have every right to demand the best from all of us. So this is a major evolution that has to happen in our school system. I think before the Bloomberg years, and I want to give a little, just quick second of history, before the Bloomberg years, the approach to parent involvement was wildly insufficient. During the Bloomberg years, the approach to parent involvement was wildly insufficient. This is something that unites both eras. There was not a strategic understanding of the role of parents. And in fact, in many cases, parents were held at arm's length. 
which makes no sense. It's like having someone be one of your top investors and then not allowing them to come to the meetings to decide how you're going to invest. So we have to see parents as a, a huge positive force in the educational equation. And when parents actually know that they are being involved and they're being listened to, and that's part of why we're going to have this moratorium on co-locations and closures, because the stakeholders were left out of the discussion. And we cannot ask them to be deeply involved in their children's education if they're being left out of the decisions about their children's education. We have to right that ship, and when we do, it's going to make a huge impact. Bill Bratton said in an interview that he wouldn't have wanted to take the job as police commissioner if John Miller didn't come. So I just wanted to see, like, you know, what you thought of that. I think uh, I, I will say what I interpret that to mean. I think what he was saying is that he considers John Miller a crucial partner in the work, and I think the world of John Miller, and I'm thrilled that he uh, joined us. And I think it was simply a matter of the commissioner saying how much he believes in his deputy. Yes. I wanted to know what you think about this whole George Washington Bridge scandal. What did you think when you first heard the details? How do you make sure that things like that don't happen again and, you know, at a lower scale in your administration? Look, it's really troubling. Uh, what happened was absolutely inappropriate. Um, I, I was pleased to hear um, some of the changes that Governor Christie talked about today. But this was a big problem, and this is not how we're supposed to treat the people we represent. And I can simply say, as uh, someone who's concerned about all 8.4 million New Yorkers, a lot of New Yorkers got caught up in those traffic jams. And so our people were treated wrong by those bureaucrats. And we're not going to allow that to happen, obviously. So I, I hope that's the last we'll see of anything like that. What do you think of Chris, the way Christie reacted to it today in the press conference? All I can say is I'm glad he came clean and said that he would take resolute action. But I think it, you know, it obviously raises bigger questions of how something like that ever happened to begin with. And it's unacceptable. And uh, it's not tolerable for anyone in government uh, to play with the people's needs that way. It's just it's not professional. It's not mature. It's absolutely immoral. Yes. Um, earlier today, you swore in a new class of recruits, <coughs> NYPD recruits. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak at all about your relationship with the department. You had a lot of praise for the police um, during your remarks, during the campaign. You were um, a fierce critic of many police department practices. And Bratton today, in his speech, the police commissioner told the recruits, you know, this mayor uh, is behind you, he will support you, he will support your families, almost as if sort of trying to reassure them that, that you have their back. Um, do you feel like you need to work to sort of smooth things over with the police department after the campaign? I think the fact that I have intense respect for the men and women who serve us is self-evident. It has been for a long, long time. I've been in public life a long time. And I referenced today the experiences I had that were incredibly gratifying when I was a city council member. I live in the 7-8 precinct, and I also represented uh, the 7-6, the 7-2, and the 6-6. And I had a very close working relationship, not just with the precinct commanders, but with a lot of the beat cops and a lot of the community affairs cops. And we worked seamlessly together, I mean, every single day. And so I, my sense of the NYPD is from the grassroots up. I have immense respect for how hard our officers work, how dangerous the work is, how complex it is. And I tried to communicate that today. You know, we're going to have, over the course of time, when it comes to uh, any given mayor, any given commissioner, there's going to be policy issues that come up. And I happen to disagree with what Mayor Bloomberg did. I happen to disagree with what Commissioner Kelly did on issues like stop and frisk. But I never thought that reflected on the quality of our men and women in uniform. In fact, I knew even better than that, because I heard from so many beat cops, you know, on condition of anonymity, that. They didn't like the quota system that came with stop and frisk. They thought it was stopping them from doing their job and uh, hurting their relationship with the people they were trying to serve. So I'm very comfortable with the very positive relationship I've had with the men and women of the NYPD. I think some policies stood in the way of them being able to do what they came here to do, and I'm glad we're changing those policies. Sally. Um, Mayor, when you were at Councilman, you were on the leadership team, and you had the General Welfare Committee after you, know, you, you booked the speaker. And a lot of Dan Gorodnik supporters are saying they're worried that they're not going to get good committee assignments, they're not going to get on leadership, that sort of thing. Have you discussed this with the new speaker? Have you encouraged her to be you know, judicious? Do you expect her to be? I've congratulated her. And as I said yesterday, I think she's going to be an extraordinary speaker. I think she's a very, very talented and committed person. I have not gotten into the details of how she's going to choose her leadership. That's her job, obviously. Um, I think the only thing I'd caution is I think each year is different. 
you know, I participated in the speaker races in 01 and 05. Those two were different. This one is different. The conditions are always different. Uh, I am certain she wants to work with everyone. And I think in the final analysis, everyone in that council, all 51 members, came to the conclusion uh, that they needed to work together. And that's why you saw the unanimous vote. I, I also want to say, I think it's evident today all over the city that there is tremendous pride in the historical moment uh, that's been achieved by Melissa Mark Viverito. Uh, for too long, there was not Latino representation at the highest levels in this city. Uh, many, many people tried. And I know there was intense frustration in Latino communities that there wasn't that kind of representation. And for the first time in the history of the city, this very day, we woke up in the morning with a Latino citywide official. And it's a great, great achievement. And I think people are very proud of Melissa. And I think she will continue to make them proud. Yes. Yesterday, the Obama administration offered some guidelines for um, school districts how to reduce the disparity of, in, among students who are expelled uh, or suspended or arrested. And that disparity is also in the New York uh, school yes. system. Do you have a specific plan for how you're going to attack that here? I, I know in principle what we want to do. We don't have the specific plan yet, but I, I know that we believe there have been mistakes made and there has been a clear disparity and that we want our approach to discipline to be just as fair and even-handed and colorblind as everything else we do. And too many children of color were disciplined in a way that was exclusionary, and we can't have that continue. So I think that was an important report, and it's certainly going to be helpful to us uh, in guiding our approach. Last question, guys. Yeah. Well, two. So one and two. As was mentioned, you were the chair of the Welfare Committee when you were in the council. I'm sure you're aware of the, the Miles boy that was found uh, dead this, uh, in Midtown. Do you know if the ACS have been tracking his family all, at all? There were reports that there have been other issues that maybe his uh, sister had been taken away. Are you aware of ACS knowing about him and if, if they've done anything in the past and been, uh, you know, had a file open on him? Look, I'll speak broadly. These cases are very sensitive. This is a very painful situation. And I was the chairman of the General Welfare Committee for eight years and then for four years as public advocate remained involved and I'm going to be deeply involved in these issues. And I've got two people who will be working uh, to make ACS stronger all the time, our Deputy Mayor Lillian Barrios Paoli and our Commissioner Gladys Carrion. Um, every one of these tragedies, I can speak for them as well, we feel every one of these. We can't rest until we make this system better. Um, I think there are a lot of complexities in this case, um, but I think it is a reminder to us that we've got to find ways to reach uh, children, even sometimes when it's hard to see where the problem might be. We've got to keep looking for more ways to identify where a child might be in danger and to get to them in time. And it's a very, very painful situation. The one thing I can say is I know a lot of the people who do this work and they put their whole heart into it, our, our uh, child welfare workers. And um, I know they feel as I do every time that we don't get there in time, it, it tears at our heart, and we've got to do better. Could this be another Nick's Many Brown situation? Uh, it, you know, the, uh, it's very hard to compare these tragedies. I think the, the Nick's Mary Brown tragedy was one that taught us so much because there were so many warning signs that so many people saw, including everyday New Yorkers. The, the interviews, if you haven't seen them, and if you are focused on this issue, go back and look at the newspaper clippings of people who said, you know, I heard her screams and I didn't know if I should call someone and now I wish I had. I, I don't know if there was anything like that in this case. That, that one was so tragic because so many opportunities were lost to save her. And I do want to say in fairness, and this is something I worked with the Bloomberg administration on, after that tragedy, profound changes were made, very important changes that last to this day. After Marcella Pierce was killed, major, major changes were made but it is never ending work. We're, we're here celebrating children who are alive and well and vital, and, and we know what every child is supposed to get to experience. And every time we lose a child, it is another call to arms. Last question, please. news about uh, an initiative that you put in when it was super cold outside so that homeless families could yes. come and seek shelter. Um, what other initiatives have you implemented in the past week that we might not know about? Well, as we implement them, we're going to make it a point to announce them. I mean, obviously, a lot is being done when you're responding to emergency. We try to 
follow the practices that we know work, and then wherever we see an opportunity to do better, to act immediately. And the, the code blue situation is one where we knew, and certainly our um, Deputy Mayor Leon Bar Barrios Paoli knew immediately, as and she felt as I did, that we had something we could do better right now and make sure that families knew they could come in for shelter. But we'll be doing a lot of changes. You, you just have to refer to my platform if you want to get a look at what they're going to be, and then we'll be announcing them as we do them. Thank you, everyone.